So now I know why I'm so tired. <laughs> so it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I welcome you to Mohawk Territory. <laughs> huh? yeah. We have regions, right, where we gather together, but it's important to recognize First Nations and where our land base is too. And that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about in the next hour or so. We'll see how long it takes to kind of process things. So when Colin asked me would I want to do a, a, a talk, we were having a wellness fair, I said it's on a Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm so pleased to see so many people show up on a Saturday, right? With such beautiful, beautiful weather Saturday. and a beautiful Saturday and to be able to come out and, and listen to something that, that is really important. It hits everybody. It hits all of us. Um, but it's something that's been a secret for a long time. So the theme of this workshop or this gathering is healthy communities, healthy people. And so in order for us to have healthy communities, we need to be healthy. Right? We need to look at what does that mean? How can we be healthy? And sometimes it's a bit of a stretch huh? to be healthy. Like there's so many things now, like just last week we can't eat processed meat anymore, right? <laughs> like you're gonna get cancer if you do this or that or this or oh, yikes, it's scary to live, right? Because you think you're gonna die, my God. So it, it's about how can we process some of this information and be able to be okay with it, right? I had the privilege of working for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada across Canada for the past six years. And it started in 2010, the Truth and Reconciliation. I wasn't actually working with the TRC. I was actually working with Health Canada who supported the TRC. So when they first came through with the idea of it's really important. Residential school survivors got together and started to see that they had really similar stories and that the stories were not okay. And that it was really important for these stories to be told and what the process was about that. You know, how that all came to be. And so when they started talking about, well, we're going to get people to tell their stories. People who know what it's like to tell a really difficult story know how much emotion is brought up when that happens. And so in consultation with Health Canada, we said, you know what? We really need to have people there who are going to support those people who are going to testify, who are going to give their testimony so that they can continue to be OK and so that they can heal. Not only that, but the people who bear witness to those stories also get traumatized. Okay. Because a trauma is when an, there's an experience of fear or life-threatening information. When you hear of somebody else's experience of a life-threatening situation, your feelings freeze so that you can manage to get through. Have you ever sat through something and you're trying not to cry, right? Because you're, you're like trying to get through this experience? You're freezing your emotions at that time so that you can manage, right? So that you can keep it together, so to speak. That's holding trauma. And when you hold trauma, and hold trauma, and hold trauma, and hold trauma, right? You see? It's cumulative. And it creates a dis-ease in your human system, right? So it's not healthy. It's not healthy to hear that. So what we realize is that not only the residential school survivors who were testifying would be having a struggle, but also the people who were listening to those testimonies would also be holding that. And so we devised a team of about 400 health supports across Canada who would help to support during that time. And so I was one of the people who, who helped to facilitate that. And my experience was I was able to go to all of the Truth and Reconciliations except one in Nunavut. And that was a good one, apparently. I missed it. <laughs> but their stories are a little bit different, too, in, in the, the upper part of Canada. So we're going to go a little bit on a journey today, okay? Because how many people have heard about residential schools? Awesome. Look. <laughs> they put their hand, no, look! <laughs> Almost everybody here has heard about residential schools. Wow. 20 years ago, maybe two people would have put their hand up. Okay? So the impact of the Truth and Reconciliation has made a big difference. 
right? Because you're coming here on a Saturday to listen to this, <laughs> right? So that's really important. So there's truth and then there's reconciliation. And I put some slides up mostly because it helps keep me on track, <laughs> but also it's good to have a visual, right? So um, I'm really privileged today to have some great support here. And uh, my family are here with me and they often, I don't think you've ever heard me speak. So this is like, <laughs> oh my God, my mom's here. <laughs> yeah. And my two sisters are here. And my nursery teacher. <laughs> yes. We, we actually have the privilege of having two residential school survivors here today. As far as I know, unless there are more, but Franklin and Gagayusta. So when we speak the truth, it's important to know that this isn't like, you know, hundreds of years ago this happened. It's not. It's, it's really, really recent. And in fact, as we go through, you'll see that 1996 was when the last residential school was closed. 1996. Yeah. So that's my mom and my son and my granddaughter. <laughs> Just because I can. <laughs> and other First Nations. So we're talking about truth and reconciliation. And so the truth is that First Nations experience in history has been invisible or misrepresented in Canada. Would we agree to that? Yeah, yeah. And that it was not until June 11, 2008, that Canada acknowledged that it strategically abused and tried to get rid of the, fir the whole First Nations population. So I don't know if you remember that apology when um, Harper, Harper, um, Harper. <laughs> <laughs> um, made the, the apology to First Nations people. You know, and that was, that was pivotal, you know, it was many things, but it was pivotal in acknowledging that there was a, uh, a misrepresentation and a strategic plan to get rid of First Nations across Canada. And unfortunately, racism and oppression continue to exist in many forms. And I think that's pretty indicative in the past week when we've heard about all the things that have been happening in Baldor. Right, by the, the police, the SQ, who've been picking up women and a um, lot of sexual abuse and offense, especially to women at, and men as well. So more of those stories, unfortunately, are starting to come forward too. And you know what happens is that when we work through things, when we start to tell the truth, what happens is that people start to feel like it's okay to tell the truth. Right? And so that usually there's, there's a surge of more information and more stories before there's a resolution. So oftentimes when I work in, in social services and such, we're like, oh no, if you talk about sexual abuse, people are going to talk about sexual abuse. We're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we want them to talk about it, right? Because that's how you heal. So many, for many years, the idea was, shh, don't say anything. Right? And this is true for any family problems. Don't talk about it. Don't say anything about it. Okay? And that's kind of a norm of how society tries to run. But it makes us more ill. Okay? The truth is that more than 130 residential schools operated across Canada, and the federal government has established at least 150,000 First Nations, Métis, and Inuit students passed through the system. The last school located outside of Regina closed in 1996. Those numbers are astounding, huh? Yeah. But what's unthinkable is that in Canada today, there are currently three times more Aboriginal children in child welfare system today than the number of children in attendance at the height of the residential school systems in 1940s. It's a problem, huh? Why? When we look at trauma, and like I said, trauma is when something occurs and you're, you freeze up. 
When we talk about multi-generational trauma, this is trauma that gets passed down through the generations. And what happens is that it's cumulative and collective emotional wounding across generations. Okay, so when you're told that you're no good for who you are, that gets passed down. When you're told that you're no, not okay to be First Nations, that gets passed down. And it's hard to feel okay about who you are when people are telling you that you're not okay. So even when it's safe enough to talk about things, now there's still that that's carried inside each of us through the generations. People have called it a soul wound. Actually, Karina Walters did some studies in, in, the two, in uh, 2000 and talked about the effects of centuries of colonialism and genocide and oppression, called it a soul wound. And a soul wound because sometimes you carry that inside you and you don't even know what it is. It's there, but you don't even know. You know? And so it's something that when I work with people, it's like unpeeling. It's like looking inside. Why do I feel so bad about myself? Let's try to find out. But this stuff is often hidden. It's underneath it all. So when we're trying to heal trauma, when we try to heal from trauma, what's really important is we have to be able to name it. What's the trauma? You have to be able to name what it is, regardless of what trauma we're talking about. Right? So if you grew up in an alcoholic home, it's really important to name that that's what happened. To name it. To name that's, what you, that's what's bothering you inside. You have to be able to own it. How has it affected me? So when we talk about residential schools, we have to be able to name that residential schools affected us, and we have to own it. So what is our responsibility? How did it impact on me? For me, I'm second generation and third generation residential school. My dad went to residential school and my grandmother went to residential school. But for you guys, what was your influence about that, right? Who in your family was running some of those residential schools and how does that impact you? So it's important also to look at that because that's also trauma that's carried. And again, research is looking at how, how if we look at the Holocaust, right? people who are coming from German ancestry, there's a lot of, of grief, a lot of trauma that they have to deal with as well. Not only the Jewish population, but the, but the, but the German population. You know, so oftentimes when I was working with the Truth and Reconciliation, people who were hearing these stories were feeling really guilty, were feeling really bad. That's also traumatic. We need to resolve it. We need to own it, name it, and own it. So know how it's affected you. And then feel it, right? Feel it. It's the yucky part of work, right? It's to feel what's underneath. It's to feel the pain of it or the guilt of it or the whatever it is, but it's to be able to feel. And that's the grief work. And the only way that you resolve that is by sharing it. Because you can feel alone. You can feel, oh, I feel really bad, and I, and I can feel it alone. But we know that healing only happens when you share it with somebody else. But when you've come from trauma, the one thing that you really need is a connection, and the most scary thing is to have a connection. Right? So you ever go like, I'm okay. I don't need any help. I'm good. Hmm? Yeah, everybody's shaking their head because it's not only a First Nations issue, right? It's everybody's issue, right? It's a human issue because we're humans and that's how our brain works. So that when something is scary, we freeze it. And then we have to unpack it. And if we don't unpack it, our body makes us unpack it. Hmm? That's how we get a lot of the illnesses that we have. And that's how we heal. We heal it and we rebuild. And that's really what we're doing today. So we're going to unpack it. But by you being together with First Nations people, we're rebuilding. Okay? So even this event today is about bringing things together. So when we're naming it and we're owning it, we need to see what happened. So for First Nations people across Canada, now you're privileged to be next to Mohawks. Yeah. <laughs> We're the best. But, no. 
<laughs> Just saying, no. <laughs> I work a lot with the Cree too, and the Algonquin, and they're, they're good too, but you know, no. <laughs> but since you're here, I put the, the water drum, because that's our drum. Our drum is the little one, right? When you go out west, you have a big drum, right? So there, it's depending on what kind of trees you have. That's how you make the drum. Mm. We've got birch. That's what we use, uh. <laughs> right? You go out west, they got big drums, <laughs> right? You use what you have. And so for us, culture and our ceremonies and our language and our medicines were, were at our center. All of our culture is about giving thanks for what is. You look outside and we give thanks. We give thanks for all that's here, that's here to, for us. And we acknowledge that and it puts our place, right? So when you look at the trees and you breathe and you feel grounded. That's our culture and our ceremonies. And our view was to have that. And what was most important was to have the children. So we have our culture and our base and our ceremonies and around that are our children. They're our most precious asset, right? They're who will build who we will be. And then around the children were the moms. And the moms made sure that their children were well taken care of. The moms made sure that they knew where their kids were and that they would be safe and protected. And not only your own mom, but other moms, right? Hey, get down, <laughs> right? It was a way of taking care. And then around the moms were the grandmothers and the aunties. And the grandmothers and the aunties made sure that everybody was okay. And the mom always had her back, right? The mom always felt like, yeah, all right, she's there again, but she's there, right? And that was important. And then around everyone were the men. And the men ensured that there was food. The men ensured that we were safe. The men ensured that they were, we were all protected. And those were really important roles. And when we first were here, before you guys came, <laughs> Over the bridge before you came over. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty much how we functioned, right? That we had our ceremonies, and our ceremonies are long. They go for days, and they're based on the seasons. So depending on what's happening, that's what we'd be doing. We just had the harvest festival, and it acknowledges all the food that comes from planting because we're planters, right? We're farmers. And so our ceremonies were always there to take care of that. And when the Europeans came over, right, we actually had an okay relationship for a long time. We had an okay relationship, you know, that you learned from us how to trap, how to take care of things, how to plant. You learned a lot and we worked together. And mostly things went really well, right? We had agreements. <laughs> We have the two row wampum. You, you ever see the flag that has the two strips on it? That strip, those two strips are about that we're different, but we're equal and we can, we can have our own way of being separately, but we can be on the same place. It was an agreement, it was a treaty that was signed. We'd acknowledge that. Us as a nation and you as a nation, that we would live in harmony and differently, but it was okay. And then things changed. And it was in, when Canada became a nation, in 1867, there was the British North American Act. And that's when all the treaties that were signed with the royal um, people. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, when, when, when those agreements were signed and Canada became a nation, became a country, all of those treaties were disregarded. Because now Canada said, well, we don't have to abide by those. You know, those were made with the crown. We don't have to follow those anymore. 
And that was in 1867 with the British North American Act. And that's when the concept of the reservation was established. That's when we said, okay, put those Indians somewhere because like they're really getting annoying, right? And so a reservation was established with the rules of guidance of how you can leave and when you could leave and if you could leave. And then in 1869, there was something called the Gradual Enfranchisement Act. And what that was about was that as we were working together, we were on reserves, but then some Native people were actually pretty smart and got education, right? So the, the, the government decided that if you were smart enough to get an education and you were a doctor or a lawyer, you didn't have to be Indian anymore and you could leave the reserve. That was true up into 1951. So you would become enfranchised into Canada and you didn't have to be Indian anymore. And if you were good enough to join the army, you also didn't have to be Indian anymore. And if you were a woman who was, you know, smart enough and good enough to find a white man and married him, you didn't have to be Indian anymore either. And you lost your status. So you don't have to be Indian anymore. And that act worked, uh, like I said, up until 1951. It continues to be an issue in our community with membership. It continues to be an issue across Canada. Right? So when we talk about, and you see that there's membership issues and there's questions, that's where it comes from. Okay? And it's for us to figure out, but it's, it's something, and that's where it comes from. Okay? And then, that didn't quite work because they're like, those Indians, they're still like holding it together. <laughs> right? It's not quite working. So we need another act. And so this is when the Indian Act started. And the Indian Act started in 1876. And the idea was for um, being able to take the Indian out of the Indian. We have to find ways, right? We have to figure out a way to get rid of this Indian problem, as Duncan Campbell Scott said. We have to get rid of the Indian problem. And so we ended up having band numbers, right? Because we got to keep track of these Indians. So we didn't get tattoos, but we got numbers so we could keep track of whoever was on reserve and off reserve. And then there was a loss of parental authority and the Indian agents had a lot of influence in the 1960s. And in fact, I don't know if some of you might remember when there were Indian agents and we had to ask, can we leave? Right? It wasn't that long ago. So those were the efforts that were made and it didn't work. And so part of the legislation was that there was going to be a ban on all First Nations ceremonies, culture, and language. It was no longer allowed to practice or to use the drum. It was illegal and you would be imprisoned for it. And so people went underground to practice, right? And they wouldn't speak their language so much when there were other people around, only on reserve. And that didn't quite work. So the government said, well, we have to figure out a way to get rid of this Indian problem. So we will take the children and we will put them in schools far away from their families so that they won't have connection. And that's what was left. And I know some of you have experienced this, but what would it be like if your five-year-old was taken and put in a school far away from you? Right. The grief is pretty extreme, huh? The grief is extreme. And so what happened was that we had a lot of women, a lot of our moms who went into Great Depression. It was a lot of loss. And even today, we see that with our murdered and missing Indigenous women. 
They're not there. A lot of women. <coughs> so it's really difficult to see this, but it's really important to understand it. It's really important to know that that's where a lot of this pain comes from, a lot of this difficulty within our communities. And it happened really fast. It happened really fast. A hundred years isn't a very long time. This is a famous picture that says, a great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one. So their idea was to de-Indianize, and this is a famous portrait. Mm. The legacy of Canada's residential schools, the odds of dying for children in Indian residential schools, one in 25. The odds of dying for a war veteran in World War II were one in 26. So we have a lot of survivors who have been able to tell their story, but there's a lot of children who never made it home. There's a lot of unmarked graves, right? And that's becoming more and more. In fact, uh, Romeo Saganish, who was an MP for um, the Cree region, he talked about his story of bringing home his brother's remains because his parents were so distraught because they never knew what happened to him. And they finally were able to find out where the children were buried and they were able to bring his brother back home. So it was just one of the stories, right, that you hear. But it's the truth. So the government decided that We'll take the children away, but we need to restructure. And this is called the, the um, Advancement Act, the Indian Advancement Act. So the Indians who were more, you know, doing well, like Ganawage, we were one of the first tribes to have this structure implemented where we'd have a chief and council, right? So we're going to function in chief and council. And then underneath chief and council is going to be social services and police to take care of all the problems and issues. And then underneath them would be the schools, because the schools are going to take care of, you know, because we have cadre school and we had day schools on reserve. So if you were a progressive enough band, then you could have these school systems. And you take care of these kids who are left. And then the parents. And then the elders. But this is the hierarchy box system that we're left in for getting funding. Right? This is the system that we're all in, in Canada, because it's a box, right? How do you get funding? Well, how do parents get funding? You have to go to the school, ask the school, see if you can get some help. Okay, the school can't. Well, you better go to social service. Social service is going to find the funding. Social service, go to your council, right? So it's a system that puts few people in control without consultation. It's a box system. It's a hierarchical system, which is a far cry from the circular system that I started with, with the colors. Huh? So we're in a dis-ease or a disease. Huh? So the Royal Commission, unfortunately, found out that First Nations have higher rates of all of these things. And this is what I said about that, the um, iceberg I was looking for a while ago. So underneath it is colonization, multi-generational trauma, and unresolved grief. That's what's underneath. That's the part that hasn't been seen, right? That's the part that wasn't understood. And that's the part that's really important to understand. When I go and do talks, I often bring people with me. This time, literally, my family's here. <laughs> But there's this wonderful woman whose name is Vera Manuel, who was a playwright, a poet. Uh, she was a healer, and she did amazing work. And I had the privilege of working with her for many years. And she wrote this poem, and I'm going to share it with you, because I think it really encapsulates 
all of what our experience is as First Nations people. She wrote this probably 20 years ago, okay? Because in work as a, as a psychologist or as a healer, we would have heard these stories of residential school for years and years, right? But now that you know it, it's been taken that long for the stories to be known to the public. So Vera wrote this about people who she'd worked with. And it's called Justice. I am a product of colonization in this land called Canada. I am a result of cultural oppression by church and government. I am a survivor of forced assimilation and genocide. I am First Nations, Aboriginal, and Indigenous person of this land. Yet, I do not speak the language of my ancestors. I know little about the customs and traditions of my people. I have never fasted up on a mountain. I have no song nor dance, no Indian name to define me. And for most of my life, I could honestly say, I don't know who I am. When I look around my world, I see my people in this land of riches, confined to small spaces, forced to fight every day to protect traditional territory, living lives of poverty, similar to third worlds. I feel my rage stirring inside me. I feel robbed, a sense of injustice. When I look around my world, I see the hearts and backs of my people breaking beneath burdens of unresolved grief, nightmarish memories of childhood trauma, residential schools, foster homes and adoptive homes, TB sanitariums, generation to generation, physical, emotional, spiritual, sexual abuse and shame. And I feel my rage stirring inside me. When I allow my ears to listen to the voices of people of this land who have no mercy, no love, no compassion, no understanding for its unjust history, who come from freedom, opportunity, adventure, riches, I feel my rage stirring inside me. Who stand on the heads of my people on the graves of my ancestors and carelessly say, why can't those Indians get it together? They live off our tax money, you know. I feel my rage stirring inside me. Camouflage for powerlessness and shame. Anesthesia for grief. A sense of injustice. I feel unsafe in the white world to speak my views out loud or to share my culture. Uneasy, mistrustful. Afraid those white people will steal the very words I speak, steal my ceremonies. The sacred circle, sacred songs and dances and stories. Then use them to continue to oppress. Tell our stories from their white eyes and lie. Sing our songs, do our dances, wear our names, copy our art and sell it. I get nervous when they write things down. So I tell them straight, you can't write it down. I fight inside myself to see the human beings that they are. I am a product of colonization, the result of cultural oppression. I survivor of genocide. I carry the burden of all the unresolved grief of my ancestors in my heart, on my shoulders, and in my gut. In this lifetime, I have committed myself to fight for justice. It is injustice that is our enemy, not white people. Remember, we are fighting on the same side as Geronimo, Mandela, Gandhi, and King. We take responsibility for our rage and we fight on the same side for justice. She's pretty powerful, huh? That's really, in here, is really everything that we're going to be talking about. Okay? Because as a First Nations person, 
having a band number standing in line at Canadian Tire and I take my band card out, what are people going to say behind me? I know many people, right, who are like, well, I'm not going to use it. Never mind. Right? Because of the dirty looks. I wish I had one of those. Hmm? So it continues. But we, we do this when we don't understand. And that's why it's really important to understand. Cultural safety and human safety is an environment which is safe for people, where there is no assault, challenge, or denial of their identity, of who they are and what they need. It's about shared respect, shared meaning, shared knowledge and experience of learning together with dignity and truly listening. That's what I feel from you right now. Right? That's pretty cool. I was really nervous doing this talk. I don't know why. I haven't talked for a while. I don't know. But when Colin called me, I met him at Tim Hortons, right? And we're sitting down, and he's checking me out, and I'm checking him out. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you want me to say, Colin? And he's the nicest guy ever. Where is he? He's got... Anyway, I mean, you know, but that part of me is like, how does he want me to frame it? Does he want me to water it down? Does, right? That's what my experience was today in 2015, right? So when I was thinking about our history together, even as Shadigi or the region around, you know, does anybody remember 1990? <laughs> right? What a crazy question, right? Because it impacted all of us greatly, right? And how did we mend that over the years? Because that was 25 years ago, huh? Wow. Right? It's been such a, a battle. There were years where I was like, I'm not going to Shadagi. Nope. Right? But you know what? When you think about it, there were so many people who were non-First Nations who were helping us, just as many who were burning effigies. Right? So it's important to look at, there's different people, and it's really the behavior that's not okay. It's the behavior. And how can we create spaces that can be safe to be able to share and talk about things that are really deep, really hard? So what's reconciliation? Reconciliation starts when the story is heard and accepted as truth. Right? That's the start of it. And I have a little clip. Was anybody ever able to go to any TRC? Two, three? Okay, three people went. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission went across Canada into all the major cities to be able to, to get together and um, have people be able to testify as to what happened to them in residential schools. They went across to all the different reserves as well, but there were great gatherings in each of the major cities. So when it came to Montreal, I was the clinical advisor, and there were, I think, 80,000 people who came over the course of four, four days. And the numbers of stories that were recorded and put into a, a bank um, that they weren't quite sure what they were going to do about. Anyway, um, so that was supposed to be archived to be able to have it as Canadian history, to make it a truth, a reality, right? That was the idea behind it. And our support was to make sure that that would be done in a safe way. So because I, I figured that most of you wouldn't have known what that is, I have a clip from um, the Truth and Reconciliation, just to give you an idea of what it looked like. This one in particular is from the Atlantic region, so it was in Halifax, and you get a sense of what it was set up like and how, so from some of the survivors themselves, a little bit of their story. It was set up also so that people would listen, listen 
There were commissioners who took the testimony. There were cameras that recorded the testimony. But there were people who came just to bear witness as you are. Okay? So I'll share that with you. Members of the general. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada held its Atlantic National event in Halifax from October 26 to October 29, 2011. The four-day gathering brought together residential school survivors and their families, TRC commissioners, church and government officials, school groups, invited guests and members of the general public. This was the third of seven TRC national events, which provide public forums for all Canadians to hear and learn about the history and legacy of residential schools. The Atlantic National event included survivor sharing circles and panels, knowledge circles, film screenings and ceremonies, and attracted 2,000 visitors daily to Halifax's World Trade Convention Centre. An additional 10,000 viewers from 13 countries on four continents watched the proceedings on webcasts. As was the tradition of previous TRC national events, as well as the custom of the Mi'kmaq people, the Atlantic national event opened with the lighting of the sacred fire ceremony. Sacred fire is to, uh, is to honor all these people who went through the hard times that they come through, and they asked us to uh, do this fire for them and it's an honor to do it for them. The ashes of the sacred fires from national events in Inuvik and in Winnipeg, carried by residential school survivor Lottie Johnson, were used to ignite the sacred fire here in Halifax. I think it's getting to tell my story and to collect other stories. I always seem to worry about other people and uh, I think maybe that was part of like with the truth and reconciliation. When so many of our people were dying, mm -hmm. I felt that it was really important for us to get in there and to do something. A highlight of the opening ceremony was the arrival of a group that had walked 2,200 kilometers from Cochrane, Ontario to Halifax in support of residential school survivors. I hope from this that we can send a message to uh, create that process of hope for uh, our children and our grandchildren. The theme of the Atlantic National event was, it's about love, a national journey for healing, families, and reconciliation. It was inspired by survivors from across Atlantic Canada who shared their truths publicly and privately before and during the event. I can tell you that for the first and five years at Indian residential schooling, I do not remember talking feeling, crying, or even growing. As a survivor of the Shubenagadi Indian Residential School, I am here to verify we were treated like a herd of animals. Hopefully, sharing my feelings and story will relieve some of my torment. I was just five years old when I first stepped foot in that institution called the Shibunaidi Indian Residential School, and my life will never be the same because of all the trauma and terror I experienced in that school system. I don't want to carry their garbage anymore. I'm happy. I'm happy with my life. I'm helping the survivors. My happiness is my revenge. Thank you for listening to me. In addition to hearing survivors' testimonies, the Commission witnessed several encouraging gestures of reconciliation and apology. But I am grateful for these few moments that you have given to me to speak on behalf of the Anglican Church of Canada. I am deeply sorry for the pain we inflicted and for the terrible memories so many of you still carry today. Physical, sexual, and emotional abuses that occurred at residential schools were among the most deplorable acts committed against any people at any time in Canada's history. Our institution failed to recognize or challenge the forced assimilation of Aboriginal peoples and the subsequent loss of their language, culture, and traditions. 
That was a grave mistake. It is our responsibility. We are sorry. The Atlantic National event hosted the TRC's first education day, attended by 600 high school students. Post-secondary educators also took part in a gathering celebrating Indigenous knowledge. Now that the residential school is over, it still hurts them and they still think about it in their lives. I guess the way they would talk to everyone, the way they would treat everyone, and just how they trust people. I'm sorry that they had to go through all that. During the week, presentations were also heard from Innu and Inuit survivors who are still fighting for recognition in the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. I want the voice of Labrador Inuit survivors to be heard, to be acknowledged, and, and to be acted upon because the trauma, the emotional, and psychological trauma, the detachment from families, the severance from culture and identity was exactly the same as other survivors. The intent was the same. I heard the term kill the Indian in the child. In our case, it was kill the Eskimo in the savage. So the impacts of the trauma are exactly the same. It was torture, it was torment, it was an attempt at cultural genocide. During the Atlantic National event, five prominent Canadians were inducted as official honorary witnesses, accepting the responsibility of sharing what they have learned with others. On the final day, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police tabled a report examining its role in residential schools. Many other presentations and sessions rounded out the week, including a nightly call to gather, a talent show, and a musical concert. In the end, the Atlantic National event could not have happened without the nearly 200 volunteers who worked tirelessly to make it a huge success. So that could give you an idea, huh, of what was experienced across Canada. Do people have feelings? Good. That's healthy. That's healthy. You know, I saw some people kind of doing, right? Nope, let it out. Right? Don't hold on to that. Honor it. It's really important to honor your feelings. We've been taught so long to close it down, shut it down, and just, I'm just going to get through this, then I'm going to go to the bathroom. <laughs> hmm? Allow the feelings to be. Take a deep breath. Really bring it in and really nurture yourself. Just take a deep breath right now. Just allow yourself to feel. And I'm going to give you a little time in a, in a little while just to share some of that. Because when you feel, it's important to share it. Right? It's really important. Just be with yourself something that we don't often get time to do. Hmm. So I'll encourage you now to take a deep breath, and as you let it go, I want you to make some noise, okay? So just... <sighs> mm. <sighs> do it again. Yeah. One more time. Yeah. You feel it in your whole body, right? Right. 
So imagine what you just let out if you held on to it, right? It's not good for you. <laughs> and it's tears are honoring. Okay? It's not a sign of weakness. So one of my mentors is Jane Middleton Moss, and she's wrote, written numerous books about trauma and resiliency. And she did some, she's been working for really a long time, but she did some research and over 25 years of her work across the world, this is what she saw, is that when traumas are not given support to express, right? So when you hear information and when you experience trauma and you don't allow yourself to feel it and you don't have a process to grieve from it, this is what happens. There's disconnection. So disconnection from yourself, but disconnection from who's around you. Alcohol and drug abuse. Because when you're trying to hold things in, sometimes you need a little extra, right? To hold it down, to pretend like it's not there. Alcohol-related deaths. So that when people are drinking and that's the way that they function, there's more and more losses through violence or through drinking and driving or different ways of pretending like we don't have feelings. Domestic violence and sexual abuse. Because when a trauma is held and not processed, it gets passed down. So if you've been abused, it would hurt and it would be important to share that feeling, right? But if you've been abused and you say, didn't bother me, suck it up, right? My reaction to you would be don't feel. And so if you start feeling, I'm gonna hit you to stop you from feeling. It gets passed down, okay? So when we honor our feelings, we don't do that. But what we see across the world is this is what happens. And that we have domestic violence, sexual abuse, and then we have community violence. So people hurting each other. Robberies, muggings, rapes, right? This is what we see, the crime rate increases. We see suicide for people who can't bear it anymore because they can't hold on to those feelings. We see school dropouts because if you have trauma, you cannot concentrate, okay? The main reason why I had you breathe, right, is because if you're full of feeling, right, you won't be able to pay attention. You can't learn if you're afraid or if you're feeling intensely. So why do we have so many troubles in our schools, right? Because we keep telling kids, sit up straight and pay attention. And they just came from family violence, right? And they're just like trying to hold it together. And all of a sudden, pff, he hits somebody else who's sitting next to him, right? So kids get triggered daily in school because the trauma hasn't been processed. And this is not only in First Nations communities, it's everywhere, right? Why are teachers so stressed? <laughs> I know they're surrounding me, teachers. <laughs> And then we have homicide, so people killing people, right? Because they're angry, because they haven't processed their feelings. We have gangs, because there's a need to belong. But in this busy world, right, the teenagers who don't want to listen to their parents anymore find people who they can be with, because it's a human condition to want to be around other people. So when the parents aren't available, the kids will find each other. And then they fight each other. And unfortunately, what we're seeing now are school shootings. Kids who feel totally powerless, and so they put that out. So in First Nations communities, we've gotten to homicide and somewhat some gangs. But we haven't got to school shootings yet. But we're following your lead. It's not a First Nations issue. The idea of the residential schools came from England. 
right? Harry Potter. Well, that's in, well, anyway. But the idea was that the Catholic Church and the government actually thought it was a good idea to have these schools because it came from a place where that's what they did. Kids were sent away to school. There was no connection with their parents because they came from war-torn country, right? They didn't process their trauma. When you don't process your trauma, you think, well, it's a good idea, let's put them in these schools. They won't be acting out because they won't be feeling anything. Let's teach them to do the same thing that we learned how to do. That's the basis of racism, right, when we're pushing down, when we push down feelings. It comes from not understanding each other. We're going to, we'll make you just like us. Because the way you are is really messy and not okay. So we'll make you just like us. That's racism. When we talk about blood memory, we talk about how things and trauma get passed down, right? But one thing that's really important is that the positive also gets passed down, okay? And in our culture, what we have is spirit-centered practice. So First Nations people are in a place where we can be able to share this part, because it's only been, I shouldn't say only, but 100 years for us, where it's been thousands of years for you guys, practicing this way in the box, right? We had a source of our strength is our culture and identity, and we're starting to get that back, right? I work at a daycare where the kids are drumming and singing all day. They're having a good time. It's safe. We're starting to get our cultural back. On our territory, Mohawk language is almost extinct, really close. But more and more people are starting to take it upon themselves to go into a Mohawk immersion program to try to get the language back, right? So we have that strength we've learned because a lot of us have processed our feeling. Whoa, well, let's get back to how we were before. Let's, let's work this through, right? Because we have that. It validates that we're more than our pain, <coughs> right? So our understanding is that when we go through something, it's because we're going to learn something from it. When something bad happens, it's like, oh, okay, I guess I gotta learn something from this. It's hard, but it means we can learn from it. We're more than our pain. We're learning something. It shifts focus from a deficit perspective to the belief in inherent strength and resiliency, right? Our idea is that we're here for a reason and we're really strong people. My brother-in-law said at one point, he said, they should have killed us when they had the chance. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But we are strong people. And our most important resilient traits are courage, hope, and vision. So when we get out of this <sighs> funk that we're in, this pain that surrounds us, this is what we come up with. And that's also what all of you can come up with, too. And probably a lot of you have, because you're sitting here, right? And a lot of you are honoring your feelings, which means you're healthy, right? That's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you look on this side, you know, it's, truth and it's all non-native people who are on this side who are trying to reconcile but there's no Indians <laughs> we're like yeah I don't think so <laughs> how do we how do we make that gap right how can we work together and I know what I shared today was really hard to hear okay I, I know it was hard to hear but you were brave enough to sit and listen to it right that's part of reconciliation you know, you are brave enough to invite me to come and speak. <laughs> Mohawk? All right, all right, so all right, let her in. <laughs> 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 but, you know, what can we do here, 
right? What can we do to kind of to, to bring this together, to be able to understand each other and be able to, to reconnect and get connected without losing who we are? So here's a few little guidance tools I thought of. We need your understanding at this time so we may get stronger for each other. Please don't assume to know the answer. There are many possible answers. Please don't separate the body from the whole person. And our medical system, unfortunately, does yeah. that, right? Yeah. Your heart is, is not working well. Okay, you have to go and see that guy. Yeah, but my, you know, my system isn't working. Yeah, we'll do, do that first, and then we'll do this, right? And it's hard because medicine is finally starting to turn things around when they're looking at the whole person. It's actually part of the training in med school now. Yeah, they actually had me as a psychologist go and talk to med students. Like, whoa, <laughs> right? <laughs> you want to talk about feelings, yeah. Because two thirds of the reason why people go and see physicians is for emotional issue, right? They don't know it's emotional issue. They don't know, no. But they get 15 minutes with somebody who's gonna listen to them. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> So don't separate through the body. <laughs> Advocating means working with us, not in the absence of us, right? And silence does not always mean I don't know. Okay? Silence just means let's, uh, let's you know, wait, hang on, it'll come. We'll figure out a way to share together. Not every First Nation person knows their history. It's been a secret to everyone. Okay, So I do similar workshops like this across the territories. Okay, And now that residential school survivors are starting to say, OK, I'll tell you what happened, it's starting to be known more. And oftentimes, I'm working with second and third generation residential school survivors who say, who've heard some of the stories from the Truth and Reconciliation, not from their parents, but on TV or from somebody else. And they go, now I understand why my father was like that. Okay? Because my dad never talked about it. Never did. Never ever. My grandmother also didn't. The only thing she ever said was, I cried and I cried and I cried and then I stopped crying because nobody did anything. Right? But now it's a time where it's safe enough to talk and share. So listen to the story and watch for the strengths. Okay? So are there any therapists in the room? <laughs> oh, one way over there. Two, three. All right, cool, cool. So, you know, in therapy, you hear a lot of really rough stuff, eh? And it's hard not to join the person when they're feeling that. Because part of the work as a therapist is to be with somebody, but not take it on, right? To be able to find a way out of what they're feeling. And I remember once I was working with somebody, <laughs> this isn't funny, it's just my sense of humor. <laughs> I was working with somebody who was really depressed, like severely and suicidal, and they were talking about how they didn't know how they would survive and they didn't know what they would do next. And I was going, yeah. I don't know what you can do next either. <laughs> going, wait a minute. I was like, you should really talk to somebody about that. I'm going, oh wait, it's me. <laughs> All right, let's just hang on a sec, right? So it's looking for the strength. <laughs> so, <laughs> how do we honor our strength? This is Inez Pierce Elder who said, people may hurt you, they may bruise your body, and may abuse you, but no one can you can hurt your spirit. No one but you can hurt your spirit. Someday we will learn lessons from our pain. They will someday return to the circle, our, <laughs> oh, let me try that again. Someday you will learn lessons from your pain. They will be the gifts you will pass on. Our people will someday return to the circle and begin their process of healing and mending the hoop. Our people will become leaders in healing many of other races. Our gifts will be recognized and we will offer help to others 
as has always been our way. So we're on a journey, right? We're people who are kicked down a little bit, but we're getting back up and we're like, all right, you can help me. <laughs> help me, right? And how can we do that together? So what I want you just to think about and maybe have a little bit of discussion and questions about it is, what's reconciliation to you? What does that mean? Pulling together. A pulling together. Accept and be accepted. To accept and be accepted. Yes. So it's creating a dialogue, right? To find out. Social skills. Thanks. Employment? Employment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks. We had one here and then. I think it starts by believing what we hear that these are truths being spoken. Thanks. Mm. Thank you. Anybody else? Any ideas? There's elements of faith, of believing that it, it can be a new day tomorrow. Mm -hmm. that there are perhaps not every, perhaps we don't know everything. Perhaps there is something new tomorrow. Mm. Being all inclusive yet embracing our diversities at the same time with respect for one another, just love one another. Hmm. The way we are. Thanks. Thanks. So those are some amazing ideas. And I think as you're sitting there, you're like thinking, right? And silence doesn't mean I don't know. <laughs> right? <laughs> just because you're not like, oh, I think I got it, right? Oh, it's a process. Of Edu many education is, is first and foremost. Yeah. There were commitments made at the reconciliation, truth and reconciliation, for um, education to be represented correctly, the history of Canada to finally be represented correctly. It's going to take a little while, but I remember in, in uh, high school correcting the, the teacher so many times and getting in trouble for correcting the teacher. <laughs> no, it's Roy. I'm like, wait, I'm going to go and ask my grandma again, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? You know, we had Ghostbusters, and it's also Mythbusters. And sometimes when we have to forgive, the person we have to start with is ourselves for having buried and been silent. And I found that there are two parts of forgiveness. The one part is to, um, I ask forgiveness of those who I have hurt. And I forgive those who have hurt me. And I forgive myself. Now that was the really hard one. I forgive myself. Awesome. Thanks. Hmm. So you see, what's happening is a dialogue starting, huh? It's a dialogue. And it's a process. And so it's a, it's a start when we can look at the reality and then we can talk together. 
and finding out what can I do for myself, right? How can I do it? How can I forgive? How can I acknowledge what I've buried? What can I do? Because it really starts inside. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Thank you. That's really nice. Uh, and don't forget, don't bury those feelings, huh? If something came up, talk to somebody. Grab somebody and talk. Oh. Oh. This is Colin. See, he is a nice guy. <laughs>